But my name is Nina Kin, and I am the tech lead on the digital services team at Metro. Metro uh, is a sponsor of Data and Donuts, so thank you, Metro, for sponsoring this event series. Uh, thank you to my bosses for signing off on supporting this. Uh, one of the things that we love to do at Data and Donuts is highlight cool uh, tech jobs within government. We've been focused on transit, so here's just a couple of um, transit-related tech jobs uh, that are open right now. And we love to highlight uh, job boards as well within government. So, you know, if you're looking for a job or you know someone who is, uh, you can send them to uh, some of these links. Um, so we've got LA County listed here as well as Metro and MetroLink, um, State of California, City of LA, SCAG, which is the Southern California Association of Governments. Um, and there is also a LinkedIn newsletter that posts public sector jobs, which is really good to follow. And uh, keeping with our theme of transportation for this past year, uh, there are a few events going on uh, highlighted here. I don't know exactly what these are, but they're on the slide, <laughs> so you can check them out, Curbivore. Um, and then, let's see, oh, one more that didn't make it onto the slide, but is going to happen in downtown LA is UCLA's uh, ITS is hosting a forum on transforming transportation. So that's gonna be March 21st in downtown LA. If you Google UCLA transportation, downtown LA, it'll come up. And, uh, one thing we, we love to highlight here, uh, not just because our theme has been transportation, but because uh, we love supporting public transit in general, uh, we don't offer free parking in the parking lot in front of Lacey, but public transit is a great option to get here. So you can take the LADOT's A dash to Lacey. It drops you off right in front of the building over here. And it also connects with Little Tokyo Station where uh, you can uh, get onto the dash from the Metro A and E lines, as well as some other uh, bus lines. So uh, consider that next time if you didn't know about this already. And with that, uh, I would love to introduce today's speaker, Michael Coleman from Monterey Salinas, Monterey Salinas Transit. <laughs> Thank you. Well, hello, everyone, um, and thank you very much for coming here. Um, quick background. Uh, as you can see, uh, we've got three characters from an old movie, the good, the bad, and the ugly, on our open loops payment deployment. Um, one of the things that kind of got into this conversation and the reason I'm here today is that um, Monterey Salinas Transit has basically been working on this deployment to create an open standards, open loop payment system for our passengers over the last two and a half years. Um, it's not been a smooth process, but it has been a very successful project. Uh, a lot of things were learned along the way, both from the successes that we've had as well as some of the places where we stumbled. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I think that we tend to shy away from uh, in public service and especially in the public transportation industry is that while we like to highlight our successes, we actually don't discuss as a group or an intergroup, you know, the times where we see the things and the objects that we have to take care of and we see the things that we need to adjust in a more agile manner as we're working on projects so that we can make those projects success. And in talking with Compiler last year, um, there were a couple conversations where I was, uh, I think Compiler will vouch for the fact that I got a little passionate um, about that opinion. Um, they were kind enough to invite me to do this presentation and that's kind of what led to these slides today. Um, I, the session is fairly informal. Uh, we'll probably kind of go through our history. We'll probably make some points as we're going through. Um, but quickly, and no, I'm not expecting anybody, everybody to read all that. Um, that's Monterey Salinas Transit in a nutshell. Uh, we formed in 1973 as a merger of other public transit agencies in the area under a state of California charter to do so. Uh, we are celebrating our 50th year as of last year in operation. Uh, in some ways, we're the, we're the, you know, the, the mouse that roared. Um, by geographical area, we're one of the largest transit agencies in the state of California. 
um, by operational service, we're probably small to medium in size. So we cover a lot of territory, but we're not huge. Uh, a good example of that is the IT staff is, is roughly six people right now. Um, so we're going to dive right into the conversation. Um, so like many transit agencies, um, we were hit with a global pandemic. Um, first identified in December of 2019, it spread. Um, we saw same, many of the same challenges that other transit agencies saw. Uh, we saw interruptions in services. We saw challenges with how we were going to keep our drivers and our passengers safe during these situations. Uh, we saw challenges with drops in ridership, uh, problems with logistics, I mean, you name it. Um, and as a, as a result, you know, a lot of re-examination and a lot of heart-to-heart -heart discussions began at the executive level about how do we look at everything that we're doing as a transit agency and begin to find ways to possibly approach it differently than we have before. And one of the ones that came up and bubbled to the top uh, was how do we actually collect fares from our passengers? Uh, and an MST, it pretty much was done the way I think that most transit agencies would do it. We had a large, gigantic, you know, semi-refrigerator-sized um, cash collection system mounted next to the driver. Uh, that system was capable, of course, of taking bus passes and chits and pieces of paper and reading barcodes and all the rest of that. Uh, it was a very physical process. People would get on buses and try to feed coinage and dollars into this system. Drivers would almost always have to physically intervene at some point, and, and there was a contact situation. Uh, people would be handling money at the end of the day, and whatever was brought across with that money would be another contact situation. Uh, we were issuing bus passes at our bus stations, an additional potential contact situation. Um, and meanwhile, we're getting CDC recommendations and we're getting all kinds of statements, you know, from everybody and good ones, you know, that we should be trying to find ways to avoid that. Uh, you know, right up to the point where we're installing barriers between the drivers and the passengers, regrettably. Um, but it is a new reality. So looking through all of that, um, you know, we got approached by Cal ITP um, and a discussion began to ensue about how do we begin to adopt technology that you're seeing used in other industries and other ways that basically remove that contact from the equation and, and still allow somebody to pay a fare, or otherwise known as contactless payments. There's nothing new about contactless payment. Uh, it was actually tried in Europe, in the United Kingdom in 2008. That was the first NFC-based credit cards were issued there. Um, the technology is used in design and manufacturing of contactless payment devices worldwide. Uh, the core pieces and the chipsets and everything that are involved with doing contactless payment reading is prevalent almost everywhere. It, the chips themselves are available for pennies. Uh, it, it is a very present system. Uh, you know, nearly all the credit card holders in the United States by about this moment and this time have an NFC chip embedded in their cards whether they know it or not. Uh, most of them do have tap-to-pay capability. Even more importantly, almost everybody, without exception, if they're holding a smartphone in their pocket, have an NSC device that is capable of making a contactless payment action. Uh, I pulled that statistic, actually, I think last week. 300 million Americans and 85% of the U.S. phone holders are capable of doing NFC. So... This wasn't an issue of public transit being ahead of the curve in this deployment in any way. This was really an issue of public transit being in a situation where critical mass had already been reached, you know, in the United States and certainly worldwide. We just weren't taking advantage of it. So, open loop. That leads to the next question. So, very quick definition. Open loop payment systems refer to payment methods that can be used to make payments without having to be part of the system itself. So, in essence, in an open-loop system, whether we are a Target, whether we are a Starbucks, whether you are a movie theater, regardless of what you do, none of these retail stores, none of these injury, in, uh, you know, none of these, none of these places, are actually banks. They're not handling, you know, they're not handling cash as a banker. They are not 
doing PCI compliance. They, they are not doing all the things that normally you would see in fintech or financial tech. Uh, all they're doing is they have basically made an arrangement with somebody that provides that processing for them on the back end, and then they are generally getting a device, often from the same company that is providing the payment processing, and installing it at their location that is tied then into their cash management system and their payment system. That tells them that tra that transaction has been completed. And for a nominal charge, that money is then tra transferred into the accounts receivables of the organization. Um, so with that, you know, when you begin to use a system like that, you pretty much can accept anybody's payment method that is part of that network. Um, so the big ones, of course, I think everybody knows, Visa, MasterCard, Discover, Amex. Uh, but there are also a lot of other smaller ones. I mean, you're seeing Google get into this as well. You're beginning to see Facebook looking at getting into it in some way. Um, all of them basically can get into the system because there's an agreed upon set of standards and there's an agreed upon set of way to do transactions. So looking at that, and as we began to have that discussion with various vendors and with Cal ITP during this, the idea was is that taking the contactless payment devices that were relatively standardized now as a device, combining it with an open loop payment standard, we were actually going to present passengers with, you know, what in IT terms are called a minimalist user experience. So in an agile deployment or in a minimalist experience, or as a friend I had who, you know, was a software developer, used to call it sometimes gamification, um, what we're doing is you're creating basically a system where we don't have to explain to people how the system works or we don't have to put up a guide or we don't have to have a customer service agency explain to them what they need to do to purchase a bus pass or feed cash into a cash machine or figure out the timing on this or how long it's going to get them or what it's going to do for them. We're simply going to have a very basic interface device that is immediately going to look like interface devices that they're comfortable with and that they're using elsewhere and that they don't need any additional training on and they can simply go ahead, do the transaction and move on. Or, and I stole unapologetically from Gillian Gillette over at Cal ITP, we really are talking about creating a payment system that is easy as buying a cup of coffee. And it should be no different. Getting to that system means that any person who wishes to ride our transit system, any person that wishes to go on our transit system, whether they're familiar with our transit system or not, can basically board and accomplish that task. So okay, we had the discussions. We're on board. We want to do this. So we begin to bring the people together. You know, MST working with the California Integrated Travel Project, Visa and Little Pay decide to be a launch partner. We decide to pioneer this system and begin rolling it out. That does make us one of the first transit agencies in the United States that basically decides to tackle this. Um, hopefully, the goals, as I've stated, it would become a minimalist, intuitive system. Uh, hopefully, it would remove MST from a PCI compliance situation which, you know, for a small agency like ours is no little thing. Um, hopefully, it basically, the big one and the payoff is it creates a situation where now and going forward into the future, we're actually reducing the physical transmission of, of viruses, contaminants of any kind between the folks that are, you know, responsible for operating those buses every day and, and dealing with the public and the public that wish to ride those buses. And, of course, then that led to, we're committed. <laughs> so we've made this decision. Uh, we're doing this basically during a full global pandemic. We're doing this, as I think many people saw, a ridership collapse. So we're not having that many people ride our buses to begin with, and we're interrupting service on a regular basis. Uh, in addition, I think one of the things that probably nobody anticipated is we're also doing it dur during a full logistics and supply breakdown. We're suddenly finding that we're talking to vendors that are coming back to us and they're basically giving us ETA on technology parts of a full year out. And in the middle of all that, 
we've decided to tackle what arguably could be called a transformational digital project. Um, I actually, very quick background, uh, certainly not by choice, uh, just seems to have worked out that way. Uh, people who wish to look up my, my, my background and my experience in other organizations will find that probably there are hints that I have walked into organizations that were in crisis mode. Um, done a lot of crisis management over the years, been in a lot of situations where, you know, we needed to address issues quickly and take care of things. One of the very first rules in crisis management is that you take all the distractions that are not necessarily have to be accomplished right now at this minute, you get them off the table and you focus just on the crisis and solve it. Um, we basically have adopted a project that we are now folding into our crisis management plan. Uh, that's a real mixed bag challenge. Uh, with that, the flip side to that argument is that one of the things I have found that is almost conversely true is that being in a crisis situation or being in a transformational situation does actually allow you opportunities to completely rethink how you're doing things and completely re-examine the processes that you're using and maybe take a moment to bypass what I would call the more formalized process structures that you used in making a decision and make quicker decisions. Uh, in IT, of course, we call that agile. Um, but developing a technology initiative under these circumstances does mean that you really have to be agile, agile in how you're doing this. Um, it absolutely means that you're going to be having multiple balls in the air. It absolutely means that you're going to be combining some crisis management with some agile development. It, it means that the project's probably going to pause at places along the way or you're going to have to pause other projects along the way. Um, it, it's highly stressful on an IT team. Uh, and I don't want to discount that. Um, it's highly stressful in other departments and other groups as you're trying to move these technology pieces in place that may not be fully functioning when you're putting them in place. Um, managing that from a technology standpoint absolutely requires some deep experience on the part of your technology people, a certain measure of calmness, uh, and a certain measure of core technology leadership. It's just, you know, honest answer is, is I think it's basically very difficult to do if you don't have those pieces in place. Um, and we'll take a very quick break here because I couldn't resist this one. I think people have probably seen this before. But here is how we typically do technology deployments, I think, in public service these days. Uh, you know, we, take, we, we tend to look to the public, we tend to go, we ask for feedback. Uh, public feedback is good, it's outstanding, there's nothing wrong with it, but one of the challenges you have is people tend to ask for things that they know. So they look at it from a frame of reference of what they've been doing or what they've done in the past and what they see going forward in the future, and when we get that feedback loop, that tends to be what we get the feedback. Very often, if it's grant-funded driven or it's, or it's legislature-funded driven, you know, a small amount of money is put aside for this to work on the project without really understanding the scope and depth of what the project's going to be. So, you know, that's what the legislature budgeted. Uh, we create an RFP. A lot of times you see a lot of, you see an RFP through not bad intentions of any kind. Uh, it's created by multiple departments and planning departments and agencies and grant departments uh, where IT frequently, you know, isn't necessarily the leader of the technology you know, decisions in that RFP process, and we build a process basically based on budget and what the public asks for. And, you know, we don't always get it right. That's the short answer. You know, the RFP sometimes can be interesting. Uh, you know, given that, we then approach a vendor. A vendor looks at the RFP, and we're, and, and basically in public service and as a transportation industry, we're very driven by our RFP descriptions. Uh, I think you look at a lot of RFPs in, in public service and public agencies, and RFPs spend more time defining all the steps of what the project is supposed to look like with far less concern of defining what the, what the deliverables need to be. And, and I'm going to be really upfront. Most of the time, it really needs to be the other way around. Uh, I think we need to move to a world, if we're, again, going to be more agile in nature or more results-driven in nature, RFPs are going to have to reflect that. They're going to have to reflect what are the deliverables that we're actually looking for and less about what are we defining the steps and the scope of what the vendors are going to be providing for us. And you'll see here, hopefully people are understanding that, there is some vendor defense going on here because later on we're not going to be doing vendor defense. 
Um, we get all that, we roll it out, everybody gets advertised, everybody gets excited. We advertise the fact that we're going to be rolling out the, you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's, you know, perfect. Uh, we then get into a crazy situation where we have to hurry, deploy it, documentation falls down, we get deliverables from vendors from multiple directions, there may be documentation floating around there, but nobody knows exactly where the pieces of it are, and very often technology is left at the end of this to try and figure out how we're going to assemble that and put that together for this brand new bouncing puppy that we've now inherited uh, that we have to raise and make. Public didn't get what they thought they were asking for at all. Uh, it is a technology system, it may work, it may be okay, but you know, wasn't necessarily what they were expecting, which means that, you know, that creates a situation where the public's looking at the agency and going, what were you doing? You know, what were the deliverables? Uh, most projects of this type, since we tend to be focused on steps rather than results, tend to get into overbilling situations. They tend to run out of scope because then we have to make corrections for things that we saw along the way. And vendors have staff, they hire people, they do things too, they have to cover that costing. Uh, and at the end of the day, you look at and, and really what the public needed wasn't necessarily what everybody was describing at the beginning, but again, was a result that we were looking for that was actually going to benefit people to get them what they actually needed. So we're there. We begin a project. Uh, these are the core vendors that basically started off with us in the play. Wonderful vendors, all of them. Um, I'm gonna take a moment and really do a very quick shout out. Uh, every single one of them during this process have been fantastic. Um, that's core to a good agile project. Um, without good vendors on board, without vendors who also understand an agile project, without vendors that are also quick on their feet and they can change, um, it, it's very easy for a project of this type, say, versus a waterfall or a staged project to fall apart very quickly. They all made it happen. So, we get there and we begin to dive into this. We begin receiving prototype units. Uh, very small numbers at the beginning because in all honesty, we got a logistics problem. Uh, the vendor honestly does appear to be trying their best, but we're not receiving a lot of units to play with. Uh, in many cases, you know, and we'll get to that here in a minute, uh, the units are actually not operationally complete. Uh, we begin to design the back-end system logic. We basically have an idea of how we want to do this. At the time, MST was basically doing a route system that was based on distance and time. So longer routes that took longer times and went greater distances cost more money. Shorter routes cost less. Passengers were expected to go in and understand how that system worked and purchase appropriately. We'll get to that later, but that's kind of inconsistent with the system we're trying to deploy here, and that created challenges. Uh, we make the decision to fit the pads into the route system and the payment system that we have designed. Uh, I think that would be a natural instinct for a lot of organizations. Uh, we take the technology and we try to basically fit that round technology into the square hole. Um, depending on the project, that may absolutely be the right solution. But again, there are opportunities to have that discussion about is your process actually you know, taking you where you want to go. Uh, given that we were trying to adapt that, the ITS team was basically doing some crazy updates on pads on this point. Uh, talking to my ITS manager, uh, because this was actually before I even came on board, um, there were times where they were doing six, seven, eight updates a week. Uh, and since we didn't have a back-end update system on the pads yet, since this was very much a beta deployment, that meant they were actually going out with a USB stick to every single bus plugging it in, updating a system. And again, we're doing this through a pandemic and a logistics failure. Uh, customer response, on the other hand, was great. Uh, as we're deploying this, as we're putting it out, we're not even advertising the fact that we're doing this and we are seeing people getting on board and doing it. Uh, observationally getting on the buses, 
Folks would see these devices there, they would see the sticker, and we were absolutely getting what I would call the minimalist intu you know, intuitive approach that we were looking for. Drivers weren't even having to instruct them on how to do this, they were simply tapping the device, the device was going, okay. The part of the intuitive was getting people to basically check out at the back end of the bus at the end of the day. While everybody was checking in very consistently, they almost universally weren't checking out. That led to customer service issues because as they were checking out, they were getting basically getting, getting dinged for the maximum fare on the route. They would look at their Google Wallet bill or something later, and you know we would get a customer service call. Uh, with that, we actually do begin to see pad failures. So kind of a mixed emotion situation about that. Uh, the reason I'm bringing it up and the reason it's on this slide is because one definition of an agile beta type project where you really haven't clearly defined the scope and you really don't know how you're going to get there but you understand what the goals are at the end of the day is failures are going to happen. And things are going to occur. The devices aren't going to be ready to go. That's understandable. But even so, uh, coming in after this and doing post-mortem and failure analysis, somebody with a bit of experience in this area and looking at projects of this type at the past, that is the beginnings of a red flag. It is beginning to occur at a level that probably is a bit higher to be expected simply as what I would call an adjustment situation. But given all the other things that are going on around here, that piece is beginning to be ignored. With that, we go live. The system is basically working. We're seeing enough positive response about it that MST does believe at the executive leadership level that this is a good project, it's a good long-term strategic plan. We're gonna double down, and we're gonna make it happen. So, with that, we decide we're gonna do a full rollout, complete system, contactless payment devices at our entrance doors and in our exit doors and be ready to go in May of 2021. Again, however, we're seeing challenges. The pad vendor challenges are beginning to increase. We're now seeing conversations and having conversations with a pad vendor, which they are stressed, I get it, they're very apologetic. Those are real things, but Suddenly, we're now beginning to move from a situation where the conversation is, well, this is going to be a few weeks later. This is going to be somewhat late because we have logistics issues and we have manufacturing issues. And the pad device is made in Asia, and then it has to go to Europe to be programmed, and then it has to be moved to the United States to be validated and checked for the U.S. And then it has to come to MST before, meet, you know, after meeting all those requirements. And, and it stretches from weeks to now months to now, we're not entirely certain when you're going to receive these. So this is now causing shifts in the project where we're basically having to decide to run with what we've got and, and hope that we receive more. So again, as we begin to do this project, we begin to look at it, there is one component of this project that is now beginning to elevate and is beginning to yell. Um, in the middle of all that, we're having some actually really good discussions with Cal ITP, with Compiler, with Redable Group, with others about now that we've all made this electronic, now that we've all made this digital, now that we've all made this paperless, are there ways that we can begin to pull data from other government structures and other government systems that basically create an automatic fare capping and a discounting system based on people's, you know, based on people's status in various areas, senior citizenship, veterans. Uh, one we haven't done yet, but I really passionately want to be looking at in the next year or two, students. You know, and those discussions are actually very positive. You know, as we begin to look in that, it, general agreement is, is that should be possible. So now that is broken off and we're now having another thread of discussion on where we're going on that. And check my time here real quick. Uh, the number of incidents with the various portions also begins to increase. Again, another red warning flag. Throwing into the middle of this, and, and understandably so, he had been a veteran of MST and been there for two decades, the director of IT decides that he's going to retire at this point. And he does stay on for a transition period and basically through the spring.
But the reality is, is that decision to made his leave, projects that he was focusing on in areas that he was taking begins to wind down. It's like any leadership change you have. A lot of responsibility shifted to the ITS manager for this project. And I'm going to shout out, Scott Taylor is a phenomenal person. Uh, he's probably more responsible for the success of this project than I am. Uh, day in and day out, he made it work. But the fact of the matter is, is he's been leading an ITS department and an IT support group, and now he's also being put in a position where he has to be totally in charge of deploying this managed, you know, initiative. Um, unsurprisingly, and that's bad, we're now seeing a number of IT and ITS projects that just simply aren't getting paid attention to in this. Um, that, that's an issue that we all deal with. Uh, honestly, we'll call it the tyranny of now. Um, the fact is, is that we, we haven't come up, we have to adjust. But we're not really having a lot of conversations about how we decide which projects that we have to pay attention to, which projects we don't have to pay attention to. We're just seeing other groups that are beginning to sense that as all of this is being devoted to this, other areas are beginning you know, to get shortchanged. Given that, the project continues to move forward. It continues to basically be successful. And we begin to evolve. Uh, after several interviews over the summer of 2022, uh, you know, 2021 actually, let me back up. After, after, the, you know, after a lot of discussions, uh, MST surprisingly offered me a position as chief information officer. Uh, for anybody who's, again, understand, we'll go through this very quickly. Uh, I actually was a bus driver for about 12 years. Uh, started off driving for transit buses in Indiana University System. Met my wife, who was a transit bus driver at Indiana University System. And yes, we're still together. Uh, I drove charter over the road buses for a company that I actually ended up becoming IT director for at some point later on down the road. Uh, so it was there during my early part of the life, it was in my blood. But the reality was is that I went, out of, I went out of public transit, I went into technology, I went into other verticals, and actually had been in a lot of verticals. So when I reached a crossroads point where I was deciding what I wanted to do next, I had a friend in public transit who basically told me there was an opening for a CIO position on the West Coast. I'm a Midwestern person. I looked at it. We basically submitted a cover letter and a resume. And much to my surprise, they made an offer. And Carl Sidoric, while well, I was single, I was general manager, deserves an awful lot of credit for humoring me and giving me the rope to hang myself in that area. Because uh, he certainly could have made the safe choice and picked somebody who had deep experience in the transportation industry. Uh, so that decision is on, and I'm on board. And I'm drinking from a fire hose, and I have to catch up very quickly because this project is running, it is moving. And while overall it is very successful, First two weeks I'm there, I can see several warning signs that usually in other projects I would be going, you know, what's up? Uh, on the other hand, over there in the far corner, we are over 50,000 taps. And again, we have yet to advertise this system proactively in our agency at all. This is just purely from having them out there with minimal signage and putting them in place. We, however, begin to see major failures on the contactless payment devices. Um, our vendor support continues to deteriorate. The vendor, I think, has basically dug themselves into a hole. Um, the response, I think, for a lot of people and a human instinct in this situation, but it's not a good one, is that once you've dug yourself into a hole, you tend to begin to become very insular in nature. You tend to drop your communications levels. You tend to become unresponsive. All of these things were occurring, and, and even though you have a new CIO stepping into this situation and basically reaching out to them and asking questions. We're not getting a lot of responses at this point because, honestly, I don't think they have responses to give. Uh, so that situation is devolving. We're beginning to see real interruptions in service. Uh, probably the most significant one and the one that I think was a bellwether moment for us uh, was in early June our devices stopped processing payments. Uh, during this situation, it was actually our planning department that spotted that payments were being processed first, which is absolutely not the area you should be getting a warning from. Uh, 
I would be expecting my pad vendor to tell me that the system was not communicating anymore. I would expect the payments processor to be telling us that we're not getting payments anymore. Uh, regardless of which, that occurred. And, and mind you, I don't want to make it sound like it was a long time, but it was about six days in before we started to notice this. I start getting elevated, and, and if people can't tell, I can get passionate and I can definitely get elevated. Uh, questions start getting asked. We're getting a lot of responses that basically start down to, one, we're not monitoring these portions of the system. That was something that was going to come later. And again, in beta and testing projects, we'll cut people some slack. That's a given. That happens sometimes. You build the metrics and the monitoring and reporting in after you actually begin to test the product. It's a reality. Regardless, we're not getting it. Uh, two, Pad vendor basically assured us that we had devices that were 4G capable. Uh, in a post-mortem going through this, in all honesty, the devices were 4G capable. So to be fair, that was technically true. The part that wasn't true, however, and the point that where it broke down was that the firmware that was in the devices at, t at the time were not capable of successfully connecting to an AT&T 4G network. So while the hardware supported it, the firmware did not. This led to nearly a month of confusion, roundtable, problems, discussions, uh, where while we were eventually to solve the problem, we were eventually able to do a firmware update and we were eventually get the units back online again. That really was in many ways the decision making point where as chief information officer in the organization, I actually felt it was my responsibility to go to the executive leadership group here and basically tell them that this single portion of our project is not working. And we need to look at it, and we need to look at it hard. And let's try a different button. There. We'll take a pause here for real quick, because I'm getting very morbid. Uh, in early 2022, we did become the first transit agency in the nation to provide an automated method for senior citizen discounts via open loop and contactless payment systems. Uh, there are very few agencies that are doing that automatically at this point. Uh, really proud of that, really proud of the vendors who made that happen. And most of them are sitting here or have representatives in this room right now. So seriously, understand my level of appreciation because that was incredible. Uh, however, even that one didn't go smoothly. Uh, initially, when we approached this, we approached this very much as a state-level situation. We approached this with how can we work within the state of California, how can we look at the system? And, and what we found is due to circumstances going on at other state agencies, in some cases no fault of their own, uh, again, global pandemic going on, we found that, that we found we couldn't make that work. Uh, all the alternatives that we were shown, all the ways that we were basically presented, were taking us away from that minimalist intuitive solution where, yeah, we could get a senior citizen to register on the system, but the hoops that they would have to jump through, honestly, they weren't going to do it. We needed to find a simpler way. Uh, much to our delight and surprise, we actually reached out to the federal government and reaching out to the federal government wet level, login.gov was actually very willing to help us on this. And I actually think that is a wonderful, perfect solution that we actually didn't examine initially. Because login.gov can be used for so many other types of validation purposes. And one that I did not mention in this presentation, and I probably should have mentioned in this presentation, was right before the Christmas holidays, we actually added veterans to the system. And they can use basically the same basic process to get themselves registered. So now we've created a situation where every citizen in the United States that wants to use our system and if they want to use it on a regular basis and they want to get discounting, they can do it. And even more importantly, this system is scalable. There's no reason any other public transit agency that decides to use an open loop payments method cannot adopt into that system. So we're going to put that highlight out there. We're going to make that clear. And unfortunately, now we're going to get back to second project highlight, which is one of the design goals was to build minimalist and intuitive. And I've talked about that a lot. Uh, 
This one, in some ways, I'm even more proud of because this is actually a situation where MST changed their internal policy and they changed the way with how we're dealing with the passengers and the public based on the technology that was being deployed. So most situations, policy and desire and demand drives technology. In an ideal situation and in an agile environment, both actually work together hand to hand. And if you actually see a piece of new technology which is coming in and you decide to deploy a new piece of technology which is coming in and you see that there are new opportunities or new ways of doing things that adjust to that technology, you're doing yourself a massive disservice if you don't begin to look at it. And, and I actually look at this one. This one stands out for me. Because one of the things that we were running into during the process was, again, as I said, we were time and distance based on our charging system. Getting that we couldn't find an easy way technologically to automatically do that for somebody just tapping in on the front of the bus. Uh, the system logic could be done, but it was all kludgy. It was all ugly. It was all band-aided. A simpler system would basically be to abandon that process altogether and look at different fare approaches to how we're charging our customers, how we're charging passengers, and how they use the system that then begins to encourage them to use the contactless payment system intuitively. And one of the things that we actually came to a decision at, and this occurred at leadership and board level, was that based on that decision and based on changes that we were planning on making on our bus network, we simply decided that the easiest way to do this and the easiest way to leverage this technology is go to a simple time-based system. Passenger gets on a bus, they tap the device. Device says it's good, you're fine. Clock starts ticking. Two hours, we don't care what you ride, we don't care where you go, we don't care what you do. No transfers, no problems, no paper, no tickets, no nothing. They get on another bus because this is very easy to do from a software standpoint and logistically. They tap that device again, tap gets registered back with our payments processor, our payments processor notices that tap occurred within a two hour period, they simply don't get billed. And now we have created a system where there's no training. There's no intuition, there's no learning, there's nothing processed on the passenger. We've made the experience convenient for them, but it required that we had to change our fare processing network. For larger agencies, boy, I get it. That's not a simple discussion. Uh, and I'm not gonna sit there and try to even suggest that larger agencies you know, go into that as quickly and as deeply as we did. On the other hand, I am gonna tell you that that was a remarkable moment because at that point I knew that we were actually reaching a point where the transformational initiative was beginning to drive transformational changes in the organization. Now we're back to the vendor fail. So this is the thing and the whole thing that brought me, to, uh, brought me today. Uh, this was the thing that I wanted to discuss. By all means, by all measures, this is a successful project. Uh, we're going to continue moving forward on it. There are some remarkable things that are occurring uh, as we begin to hit the gas pedal and step down and implement other things. Uh, but having said that, we're now in a situation where a key component of this project is failing, and it's failing hard. Um, and if we continue to ignore that failure, it could actually jeopardize the entire transformation in the project. So. Taking an agile approach, we begin looking at this from the perspective of, I got an open loop payment system here. I got agnostic devices that are supposed to work with any payments process under, under any circumstances whatsoever. The technology is the same. The, the hardware is basically the same. There's not a whole lot of differences. There's no, no theoretical reason why I should not be able to go to another payments processor that's been vetted and approved by the Cal ITP system and gone through that initial cross compatibility check and install them on buses and see how they're working instead. Which means I get to do a comparison situation. We begin to look at that. We begin to approach and talk to other vendors and one of the vendors that was very responsive during this situation was Cuba Group. Um, they actually stepped forward during the process. Uh, I think they passionately believe in what's going on here. Uh, they provided us basically with some gratis devices to play with and test the technology. Uh, of course, we went to some other transportation agencies and discussed with them that they were using the devices. And I was beginning to see that maybe potentially I had a solution here that basically had a low failure rate, was basically doing the things that we needed to do. Um, so we started looking at that. 
um, that began leading to a process where while we were also escalating our issues with the current pad vendor, and out of courtesy, I think people are going to notice, I'm not mentioning our legacy pad vendor. Not fair. We'll leave it at that. Uh, we've moved on. Uh, we are deciding that this has risen to a situation that we're normally, we probably would have signed off on the system as is and brought it into place because we had tested it and trialed. We had the RFP, we did the waterfall, we knew all the dots. Again, we specified the steps of how we were doing. Instead, we were basically going to restructure the RFP at the end, put it out one more time. And this time, it was an RFP that had a little more meat in it from a standpoint of saying what were going to be the desirables coming out of it, not necessarily what the steps were. And now having done this project for two years, we actually knew what the desirables were going to be. We knew what we wanted to achieve with this. Long story short, Cuba won that award. And they won the award fair and square. You know, we did test it, but they were actually the best bidder on both the scoring and a presentation system. The challenge, of course, is now I had to move from 120 in-place pad devices to basically new 120 brand new pad devices uh, in a project where we were not originally planning, and thank you, we will try to accelerate. Uh, <laughs> I was worried from the beginning that this might go long. Uh, so, long story short, we had all that technology in place. We knew everything that we needed, we wanted to do. We had everything that we had. We were dealing with an open loop agnostic system, but once again, we're dealing with an agile technology challenge. While all this is theoretically possible to do, Nobody had done it. Uh, and probably this will be the only place where I will basically toot my own horn just a little bit on this one. Initial response and pushback again would be what I would call typical project response in this. I'm asking for something hard to be done in the middle of this project when we're trying to get across the finish line into completion. And the instinctual response basically from you know multiple areas, including even internally, is why mess with this? You know, why prove interoperability? Why prove a standards-based system when we could just simply plan an outage, pull all the old systems and put the new ones in place and roll over the logic? This is one where I'm actually just basically going to make a passion statement to everybody who's in technology in their agencies and who's in leadership positions in technology in their agencies. Sometimes you have to make a decision that's actually good for everybody. Sometimes you have to make a decision that basically is going to improve the ecosystem, that's going to improve things for other transit agencies going forward. This is one where basically everybody knew that this was technologically done. They were resistant to it because of the tyranny of now. With the full backing of the MST executive leadership group, we basically insisted that this be done anyway. That we change the logic on the back end systems, we work with the processors, we work with Little Pay, we work with everybody else, and we make this happen. And the reality is we did. Uh, again, can't say enough about the vendors who stepped in and did this, including the legacy pad vendor who we, were no longer working, who we are no longer working with. They did as well. We reprogrammed all of the devices. We changed the back-end system logic on the legacy devices. We programmed correctly the new devices. Little Pay changed the way they were doing their system logic on the back. We streamlined it. We cut a lot of code out. Uh, this was all done probably in the space of 90 days. Uh, it, it really was a big push movement. Uh, we installed 10 Kuba devices on our network, simultaneously operating with roughly 90 of the legacy devices. Passengers never noticed the difference. They were able to board a bus regardless of which device they tapped. They still got fare capping, they still got fare discounting. The system worked transparently for exactly 10 days. On the 10th day, and I'm just going to skip it because we only have a few minutes left, but I'm also probably just going to let this one go by really quick because I, I, much as I like to talk about failure, I don't want to have this discussion. The server and the systems for the back-end legacy payments processor was shut down. And we ended up having to do a full system move over anyway, roughly two weeks later. Uh, that was a disappointment. That's going to happen in vendor divorces, is the short answer. Uh, there was a certain anticipation that there was a chance that that was 
you know, possible, uh, regardless of which, from a technology standpoint, I actually look at that as a success. We proved the technology. Any transit agency moving forward, going forward in the future, if you need to do a gradual transition, the fact is, is the standard-based system we deploy works. You can do it. You're not looking at mass weekend moves. Now that we fin with, finish with the ugly, dirty, bad failure part of this, I'm going to give another highlight because this is a good example of technology. Uh, and we'll wrap up. Uh, we actually had a situation where we were deploying a new device that one of the feedback things we were beginning to get during the process was the new device actually shuts down boots up pretty quick, probably in less than two minutes. Uh, so it's very responsive, good device, does everything you want it to do, no problem. Unanticipated issue that we ran into is drivers take breaks. So, and we're, we're being ecologically sound. We're doing all the good things that we should be doing. We're doing all the things that we rightly should be doing. Drivers have been instructed. We shut those buses down. You take your break, you come back, you power that bus up. It takes two minutes for the device to come back up, and there are six passengers standing at the door. This actually was a solution that was internal by the ITS team. Uh, one of our ITS engineers actually went out, did the research, uh, looked at various off-the-shelf component sites and actually built a very simple commercial off-the-shelf low-powered capacitor-driven device. It keeps the Kuba device powered up for roughly five to ten minutes. That was just enough for a driver to take a break or a pause or do something without an interruption in service. In addition, when the buses were coming back to the garage at the end of the day, if there were still, pa if there were still payment transactions waiting to be pushed, the bus actually had time to push those out before the actual service day for the bus ended. That's agile, people. That cost us less than $30. We actually quoted solutions from various vendors on this. Most of them were in the several hundred dollar range. Most of them were very, most of them, you know, were very complicated, not very simple. We can service this ourselves. We installed it ourselves. We can swap and replace these out maybe in 30 minutes when they go bad. Can't do that without an internal integrated technology department. If I hadn't had an ITS and an IT group that was all mer merged together, which again is a rarity in a lot of transit agencies, we would probably not have had the communication necessary to do that. So where are we at today? I promised I was going to wrap up. Uh, we are now at over 225 successful taps since we've done this. Uh, as of checking, when I put this together over the weekend, we were over 90,000 successful taps on the production system. I'll probably be at 100,000 next week. We're going to break that barrier. Uh, usage is growing. We are finally beginning to advertise this system because it is smooth. It works. We're having very few problems with it. Driver feedback has been fantastic. Uh, they love it. Passenger feedback is mixed admittedly and skewed basically according to demographics. We're finding the folks that are more technologically aware, the folks that are more you know, comfortable with that type of technology don't want to go back. They wouldn't go back to using any other way. We still have a small cash group that we're going to have to try and figure out what we're going to have to you know, do to encourage them to move to this method. We're supporting almost everything at this point. Uh, Visa, MasterCard, Apple Pay, Google Wallet, Samsung Pay, Fitbits. You go on this thing, you tap it, that gets you through. We're actually going to be adding another announcement here probably in the next four weeks of another actual milestone in this area. So watch, it's coming. And again, we couldn't be doing that if that wasn't open standards and open loops. You don't need any fair media on our system. You can. You could buy a bus pass if you're really hung on that idea and you really want to do it. It'll go through our legacy system, but you don't need to. You can walk on any of our buses at any time, tap it in any way how you feel. You know, you got it. Register within login.gov, answer a few simple questions, you're going to get your discounts. Ride more than three dozen times on our bus in 30 days. We're automatically going to figure the charges for you and we're actually going to give you the reduced rate. It's all automatic. You don't need to sign up. You don't need to be on our app. You don't need to be on our system. All that comes down to the fact that we produced and went with an open commercial off-the-shelf standards package. You know, we use technology. Our, our reliability on the Kuba pads is actually two nines. I was actually hoping to walk into this meeting at the end of this and say we had had zero failures on the Kuba devices. Unfortunately, last week, first device quit. <laughs> it works, but the screen is blank. 
so people could still tap. They weren't getting a response. We already have the new unit. It's replaced. But by all arguments and measurements, we're running two nines. We're at 99% of reliability on these. We're actually now at the point where we're having meetings where I'm not spending four hours a week discussing what's going on with contactless payment devices, and we're talking about where we go next. Compared to the old-style mechanical cash and custom medium fare system, costs on this are almost an order of magnitude lower. This entire system and project was rolled out soup to nuts for about $500,000 in our agency. We are looking at cash fare systems right now initially because our cash fare systems are approaching uh, 18 years of age. Uh, I can tell you right now, preliminaries on that are tenfold higher. You know, my average cost per month, and it's up there in the corner, and this is admittedly just an Excel spreadsheet at the moment because the numbers are kind of playing around a little bit this early in. But I'm running about $100 per month in CapEx and OpEx on the devices. So 50 taps, the devices have covered themselves. Anything beyond that, they're, they're, they're basically revenue positive. These are the folks that made it happen. I came in a year and a half after this project. Uh, I'm the heretic. You know, I'm the one that basically asked a lot of annoying questions during this process. I'm the one that basically rocked people's boats. Uh, I you know, may have honestly slowed things down on a couple of occasions and other occasions probably speeded things up. But these are the ones that literally made it happen every day, starting with the grinning person in the dark blue shirt there, Scott Taylor, who was basically my IT and my IT spanner. I said earlier, I don't think we could have done this project without him. The number of 20-hour days he put into this, the number of time he put into this, the amount of stress and everything he put in this is remarkable. But the interesting thing is, is this is a mixed team. Some of these are pure IT people, some of these are pure ITS people, but we treated this like a technology project. It wasn't divisional, it wasn't divided, it wasn't broken down. If somebody had the skill sets to address this project, I really didn't care which team they were coming from. And last but not least, we'll put it out there. This is the executive leadership team at MST minus me right now. Um, I, again, we couldn't have made these changes, we couldn't have made this happen if, they, if I did not have a group that was receptive and open to transformational change. Um, they made the guts to hire a non-industry insider CIO. Uh, they have done a wonderful job humoring me over the last two years. Uh, they've done a wonderful job listening to me over the last two years. Uh, I guarantee you we don't always agree. Uh, but I will guarantee you that we come to positive solutions and we get along together well. And again, couldn't have done it without them. Bios, I hate them. Uh, I'm really upfront about that. I'll leave that up there briefly and everybody can basically take a quick look. I promised that I was a transit bus driver and I shared that picture with great reluctance. Uh, that was a picture my wife took of me probably about four years in as a transit bus driver for the Indiana University Transit Bus Network. And as you can see, we were very informal. And there wasn't a whole lot of uniforms or anything going on there. Uh, that's me today. I'm a little cleaner, I guess, a little grayer, a little older. Um, bottom line is, is that, you know, I've, I've been in public sector for probably about the last eight, nine years. Before that, I was in private. Um, seen a lot of different ways and a lot of different approaches to things. Uh, I think, again, the takeaway on that, if people want to take a takeaway, is industry expertise is wonderful. Um, it really is. That is terrific. But... As technologists, all of us basically know that there is a huge technology world out there. Uh, there are a lot of different organizations and different verticals doing things in different ways that can be applicable to public transit. Take the time. Think outside of the box. Look at the things that are going on around you in other demographics and other areas and other verticals because I think you're going to find that they can apply to us. And that was the bonus one that I was going to put up in case there was some time to do it. That's mostly for humor. Uh, how do we deal with technology change? Uh, I'll just let people read that uh, while I talk about where that came from. If people don't know them, that actually is basically a very poorly hacked version of a statement that was made by the late Justice Penfield Jackson. Justice Penfield Jackson actually was responsible for the trial of Microsoft's attempted breakup. So 
while he was a judge, he was a judge that was deep in technology companies. Uh, and basically, he had this observation about legal firms. Ironically, I think it also applies to public transit in a lot of areas. Again, I'll put that up there and leave the note that, you know, think outside the box if you can. Uh, it's always good to study and see what other people are doing. It's always do, good to, to look at other things, but don't get yourself caught in a loop. Don't keep doubling down on a mistake. Remember the definition of insanity is repeating the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is crazy. Break the cycle, move somewhere else, innovate. And a ban. And I ran over. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, that was so much good stuff. And uh, that concludes the recorded portion, recorded and live stream portion of our presentation. Um, we did want to give the audience.